Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 721 with Sam Glynn. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you back on the show for a second time, Sam Glynn. My man, Sam, are you feeling unstoppable today? Of course, always. Yes, that is what we like to hear. So originally from North Conway, New Hampshire, Sam Glynn is a third generation restaurateur after some time in Florida where he uh, went to escape the snow, uh, get an education in marketing and start slash end a career in the professional baseball industry. Sam returned to New England. Uh, before long, he found himself in Rhode Island and at the age of 27, he opened his first restaurant, Chop Kitchen and Drinks, located in Warren, Rhode Island. And you guys have been crushing out there. Numerous awards for best burger, not only in Rhode Island, but in the nation, which is hard to achieve there's a lot of burgers out there uh <laughs> and sam just like, yeah and i mentioned this is sam's second time on the show your episode your first time on the show was episode 197 over 500 episodes ago uh that's going back to 2015 so if you guys want to hit pause right now get on your phone head over to restaurant unstoppable.com slash 197 you can kind of hear sam's origin story uh and Sam's great with technology and data and culture. He's a really well-rounded restaurateur. I highly recommend going back to that episode. Fun fact, um, at episode 197, you were my longest ever interview at an hour and 20 minutes. They go up <laughs> to two hours sometimes now, so that's kind of fun. Nice. <laughs> so head over, check it out, get caught up. Uh, but before we dive into your story and what's happened in the past five years, let's get that motivational, inspirational, ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Uh, improvise, adapt, and overcome. It's a uh, it's a military mantra, but it's one that we apply to the that definitely applies to the business world, and uh, you know we apply it every day in the restaurant. Yeah, and uh, has there ever been a time where we need to adapt faster? <laughs> right? No, uh, we were already thinking that way. Uh, yeah. You know, we shifted our mindset a few years ago, or I mean, many years ago to that, um, and so we were a little bit more well. You know, our, our mentality going into it was a little bit more, uh, you know, thought out than, than trying to flip on the switch, you know, right when all this happened. Yeah. Awesome. A great way to get this thing started. So uh, paint that picture for us. Where were you in 2015? Kind of reflect back. What was your business like looking like? And just, just set that, 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 that picture for us. So we had, um, we've been open in 2015. We've been open for two years. Um, little 38 seat restaurant in a, a town about 15 minutes outside of Providence, um, focusing on burgers and sandwiches and beer. And, uh, in 2013, it was relatively, um, you know, unheard of in our area to focus on just a few things. I know in that podcast, we, we talked a lot about instead of focusing on a million or trying to focus on a million yeah. things, focus on a few things that, that you really are, are passionate about and think that you can do better than somebody else. And we're still doing that. Um, you know, in 2015, we were two years old. Since then, we've grown. Um, you know, we've almost grown to. We've increased sales by 40 percent. We've increased our um, outdoor dining space. We've we've refined our menu and our approach. We've gotten more efficient. You know, more productive in the kitchen. Did you say um, you increased your sales 40 percent since 2015? Because I know you were crushing it back then. Yeah. No. It's wow. um. So we were at the time you know, where we were in Rhode Island and where we still are in Rhode Island, everybody likes to eat at the same time and everybody likes to generally dine out um, on certain times of the week, right? So in our town where we were in Warren, um, there wasn't much of a uh, daytime traffic. You know, there was no industry. Um, we're in between Bristol or we're in between Providence and Newport. So it's kind of just like a residential sleepy community. Um, now it's a it's an incredible restaurant town. There's a lot of other um, really special spots in Warren that are doing some stuff that you wouldn't normally see in a small town. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good point. Sorry to interject real quick, but yeah. one trend I've definitely seen, I think you say you go back 20, 30 years ago and the, the smart thing to do was to get out of the small towns and go to the big cities for opportunity. And that's where you're going to make, uh, you know, your, your, your career is in the big cities. That's where all the opportunity was. And, I feel like now these big cities are, are almost just like over, like just 
oversaturated and people don't, it's so hard to get into these big cities now because there's just so many people and really where the opportunity, in my opinion, is, is take, I mean, maybe go to a big city to, to get that education, to get that experience, to, to operate at a very high level, a very competitive level, and then take that level of competitiveness and knowledge and bring it to a smaller town like Warren or an island. And you're going to fucking crush, dude. You're going to, you're going to be leaps yeah. and bounds ahead of people. And you're going to be like the, it's going to be like crickets when it comes to competition. Right. Um, I just wanted to step in real quick. I think that cities like Warren or Island, uh, smaller towns that are on the come up are the cities you should be looking at if you want to open a restaurant today. Yeah. The barrier of entry. I mean, rent is, is much, uh, cheaper, you know, the competition, if you're doing something, um, unique, like we are, you know, is less, I mean, in Providence. So we're, we're in the midst of, we're opening up our second location, uh, in two weeks. Nice. Um, we were supposed to open it up uh, at the end of March that obviously got derailed. Um, so, you know, in Providence, there's other burger restaurants, right? There's mm -hmm. other restaurants that are doing things that are similar to what we do. But since we've had seven years of success in Warren, building a brand, not only in Warren, but throughout the state of Rhode Island, throughout the region of New England, um, we've been able to come into a, uh, a community in Providence that already knows about us um, because we've built that brand, you know, but by having lower rent by having um, less competition, we were able to build a really great business there that supports us growing to a second location. Yeah, and As even Providence, Rhode other... Island isn't like a, new, like, like a New York City in Manhattan, you know what I mean? Like it's still like a yeah. smaller city, you know? Uh, are, yeah. you in the, are you in the heart of the city or are you on the outskirts? So we're on the, um, you know, the, the heart of, or the heart's downtown. Um, downtown's pretty small compared to other downtowns. Um, we're on the east side of Providence, which is like, we're like right behind like Brown University. Yeah. So um, even so, you're, I mean, and like, if you want to be in a city, I would say even then go to the edges of the city where like yeah. where the young people are living because they can't afford to live in the center of the city. And those are the people that are going to spend the money. Young people, especially exactly. young, like booze, like, like, those, like that's your target market. Where the young people go, everyone yeah. follows. So, okay, we're, we're getting sidetracked. Let's go back we're to five years ago. You're painting that picture for us. Uh, you're explaining why Warren was perfect for you. Take the thought from there. Yeah, so we so we expanded our hours over the time, um, over those those five years. To you know, we were doing lunch before um, before COVID hit. We were doing uh, a lot more catering. We were just getting more revenue streams coming in, and you know, every incremental move that we would make, you know, would be you know, it wouldn't be exponential growth um, that day. But you know, Friday lunches started off being okay. Um, and then you start building, you know, uh, awareness that we are now open on Fridays because we had built this, this following of people that knew at 430 on Tuesday through Sunday is you have to line up to go to Chomp to get in, right? So we, yeah. we reduced the, and as cool as I did to say that there's a line or that you can't get into a restaurant, it always drove us a little crazy because yeah, we wanted money to money right there that just not, that's yeah. not coming through. Yeah. So I'd be standing out at the host stand, uh, you know, and you see a car pull in, we have like a 16 spot parking lot. Um, they wouldn't have a spot. They'd drive out and we had another parking lot that was next to us where they could potentially go. We had a sign that says, you know, additional parking next door. And you just see them keep driving and they wouldn't come back and, you know, oh. a party of four, it's a hundred bucks, right? Yeah. So, um, so we wanted to limit the, the barriers that guests were facing to dine with us. So opening up for dinner, for lunch and dinner on the weekends was a no brainer. Um, but we didn't always have the right staff. We didn't always have enough staff. Yeah. Real, real uh, quick. What were your hours before they changed? Like, I just want to get a four, picture. Four thirty to nine, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday, and then four thirty to ten on Fridays and Saturdays. Okay. And that was more um, in Warren. The streets roll up, roll up pretty early. You know, there's not much of a, a nightlife. Um, yeah. Even there, so there is a, a good amount of restaurants now. Everybody still turns in, you know, nine nine thirty, or they'll go to like a an Irish pub, or so you're on, basically you're only open you're only open for dinner basically up to this yeah. point. Um, yep. And your plan was to slowly start, you know, turning the 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 nozzle on the gauge to to, to increase the the hours just for Friday, and then why why that approach of just slowly but surely increasing the hours? Why not just go we're open for lunch? Because um, you can't pull it's hard to pull it back. You know, once you, once you're open seven days a week, two services a day, I think that you start to confuse people. You know, if say, you know, say you don't do your research and you're open up on Mondays and you're overstaffed, 
you know, you can either pull back your hours or pull back your staff, but then, you know, you're not, you're just not setting yourself up to be successful. I think that if you slowly open up, you see where the market is, and then you kind of work at it from the other angle where you are not necessarily reactive to like the demand, but you're, you're kind of setting, you're, you're controlling the demand a little bit because you're only open for Friday, Saturday, Sunday lunch. So it's like, okay, let's see how that goes. If we're, if it's crazy on Fridays, which is still a weekday, people are still working, then maybe a Thursday, fr- Thursday through Sunday, you know, schedule is warranted. But, um, you know, we were doing a lot of takeout on Fridays. There wasn't a lot of dine in traffic where we were specifically in Warren. So it never really warranted going to expanding our hours. You know, when you expand your hours, you're expanding your labor, expanding your food costs, expanding yeah, justify it. everything. Yeah. So we always try to run lean um, now more than ever. So we just took that approach to the hours too. It's like, okay, we're going to open up for this. If people want to come, we'll see. Um, and fortunately they did. What benchmarks were you using? What, what were the, your thresholds, the things, the numbers? Because I know you're an analytics guy. I know you're big into yeah. numbers. So what number did you need to hit to justify? What percentages were you looking at or anything along those lines to know that, okay, um, we're good? So, yeah, so we, um, we look at a few different things. We were looking basically the, the kind of the light bulb went off when we were getting our guys into the kitchen at noon regardless. So they're coming at noon to prep for the night. Um, my chef Tanner and I were looking at like, all right, if we want to open up for lunch, how could this coexist? How could we be doing what we're doing already at noon, but get in a couple other people on the line that are just devoted to cooking for the service out in the dining room. And so we looked at it and we're like, all right, we need two, you know, we need one and a half people. And we're like, all right, one and a half people at, you know, 13 bucks an hour. You know, if we can do what we're projecting to do, and we're all thinking like, if we can do, you know, a thousand dollars for lunch, we'd be good. Um, more than good. We'd be ecstatic. Um, for one extra person, for an extra sixty dollars, seventy dollars for that lunch period that we add to our labor costs on that Friday or Saturday or Sunday, um, it's more than justifiable. You know, but how do you do all the other things? How do you get prepped for the busy night ahead? How do we schedule so that, you know, we're as efficient as we can be in the kitchen because we don't have a lot of space. We don't have a lot of tabletops to be making, um, to be pickling a bunch of cucumbers or to be, you know, breaking down chicken or portioning, whatever we're portioning. So we need to be strategic in that. And we figured it out. And, um, you know, we blew past the projections of what we were, of what was, acceptable for how long did it take you to do a thousand dollars on a friday for lunch friday lunch well friday lunch isn't a good sample size saturday lunch um <laughs> about an hour and a half you know at the, at the most um you know, how long we did, were you conference. were you hitting that one thousand dollar benchmark from like day one when you decided to go open for lunch or did it take some time to no get no we weren't um fridays were a bit of a struggle at first to be completely honest um the awareness. I mean, we have a great social media following. We, we were doing four walls marketing, you know, the traditional stuff, table tent, message on the check, email blast, you know, whatever, um, everything that was free. Yeah. That's like, uh, remind me to come back to that. Cause I think that's one thing you guys sure. did really well is your marketing, but I want you to finish your, your thought. Keep going. Thank you. Um, and you know, it kind of proved to us the, the theory that we had about weekday traffic in Warren, um, where there isn't a lot of people or there are not a lot of people that are looking to dine out on a Friday. Now, there were days where we would do well, you know, cover costs, be fine, and then have an incredible Friday night service. And so, uh, you know, if you look at the whole day, it was great, right? It's an extra, you know, $600,000, whatever it may be, that we didn't otherwise have for a very, you know, uh, a very small amount of other investment than what we would normally have with labor costs. Um, but, you know, then we would have great Fridays. You know, we would have Fridays just out of the blue, um, which is kind of funny because our, our business over seven years has become very predictable. You know, looking at our analytics, looking at reports from year over year, from even week over week or month to month, they were super consistent. And yeah. fr- Friday lunch, for whatever reason, was was such a variable, even up until, you know, we, we shut down the dining room um, at the end of March. 
um, awareness was growing, you know, we would have a lot of takeout. Um, a lot of people found out, you know, they only have a half an hour lunch break or they might have a 45 minute lunch break. So they can't go, you know, from where their job is to us in Warren and get back in time if they eat with us. So we started doing a lot of takeout, which is great because, you know, it's, it's money coming in. Um, yeah. So but it wasn't, let, let, let's, yeah, let's tap the brakes right here. Cause I just want to like hover over and just like summarize like the big takeaway that I got from that, that tear you went on. You don't have to go full steam ahead from day one. Like you don't have to like, it's, it's so much better just to start where you can and slowly scale into things and that compounding effect, right? Just do a little bit more, just do a little bit more. And before you know it, like you're open, you know, lunch and dinner every day, you, you have more than enough capital and people to, to justify, uh, you know, you're not, you're not just scrambling, just trying to put like a pulse into your business. You're finding the right person, right? And that's what happens when you slowly right. scale over time. Um, just keep your liabilities as low as possible and, and just slowly make those little tweaks over time. You'll get there. It's not a race. Just use cash flow and people, right. To, to, to yeah. determine that growth. And that's exactly what you did. I love it. Um, so one other thing that well, real quick, I'm curious. I know we mentioned a few times, you're, you're a huge analytics person. The last time we had you on the show, uh, you're using Swipely which is now Upserve, which is also breadcrumb. So breadcrumb, Upserve, <laughs> I don't know what they're, if they're just going by breadcrumb now, but basically um, that's the company you're using. Are you still with them? We're not, no. Okay. We, um, we switched a few years ago to Toast, oh. another, um, another bread uh, item. Yeah. Um, which is kind of ironic. But um, what we found, you know, Upserve was great for us. It served a purpose for us for a while. What we started doing a year ago, year and a half ago, internally was just looking at our systems and how efficient we were and um, started looking at kitchen display screens, started looking at really trying to get data on how efficient our kitchen was. You know, you can see even through Upserve and Swipely and, you know, credit card data and guests, you know, data is great. Um, but we wanted to kind of look more at, how quickly are we getting food out? Um, not, not in the sense that we just want to get food out the wind out the door and not worry okay, about streamline it. Like, process. Like, you know, how can uh, we streamline? Like, yeah. yeah. So we got Tanner and, and myself got, you know, I wouldn't say addicted, but we got very obsessed with trying to make things more efficient. And, you know, if you look to any time that we want to do something like that, we'll look to people that know way more. Like if you go to Chick-fil-A anywhere in the country, and you look at their drive through operation, you are like, my God, this is, you know, there's all those jokes about these people should be running the country, right? If, yeah. if they can make it as efficient as they have, you know, what else can they do? Unfortunately, so, the country isn't as com or is a little more complex than chicken. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, but the, you know, the kitchen display screens and just their systems for still having quality food, but, you know, doing it really quickly was like intriguing to us. So it's like, all right, what are they doing? And kitchen display screen was the, you know, other people I talked to, other friends um, that had started using it through Toast. They cut their ticket times down in half. They, you know, they got less um, sendbacks because of missed modifications on tickets. They got, you know, all of these little things that were like, oh my gosh, if we could do that, you know, we could cut down this by two minutes. You know, in two minutes to us over the course of a 12 hour day uh, that were open, you know, that could be an extra turn, you know, that extra turn in the restaurant or that car that pulls in that pulls back out and goes down the road. We now capture because we got, we've just become more efficient. You know, people are still spending um, time with us, but they're not spending it waiting for us to get them food. Yeah. So, so were you implementing the tablets from day one or are you even implementing um, the tablets? No, we're, no, we're not even using, well, we use that in our beer garden because it's a little bit further from the, the main terminal. But what we started doing was um, just literally almost overnight, we cut ticket times in half. So just from the, the kitchen display unit? Just from that. Wow. And we also supplemented that with our, it's uh, a CVAP oven made by Winston Industries. They were created for, chick, uh, for um, KFC to hot hold chicken so that it's crispy, like literally throughout the day. So if you go on YouTube and you type in CVAP oven, there's a million videos on restaurateurs across the country using it for different applications. Some people use it for fried chicken. We use it for our burgers. So think of it as 
you know, if you are at home and you're cooking a burger, you take it out of your refrigerator, it's 38 degrees, you put it on a 400 degree grill, and it takes you 12 minutes to cook it mid medium rare, right? We're doing the same thing, but we're doing hundreds of burgers a night. So if you look at all that time, it's a lot of time for one burger. So what we do with our CVAP oven is we hot hold our burgers at 110 degrees. So instead of getting it from 38 to 145, 150, um, depending on how people are ordering it, we're only bringing it up an extra 30, 40 degrees. So that time is cut in half. So yes. it's, I don't know how much the experience you have in that or who, who else you might have no. talked to that. Well, I mean, that we've had people mention CVAP a few times in the show. And for people who aren't completely familiar, it's kind of like a combination convection hydro, like a steam oven that you would think right away, like, why would you put, you know, a burger in that dry heat? It's going to dry out or like whatever. But the thing is, you, I'm assuming that you, you have control over the, humi the humidity. So it's staying very moist. Um, yeah, I don't know what hundred percent of it. Yeah. So it's a very powerful tool and it, it saves on, uh, energy. It, it's a great, because think about it. Like, have you ever put your hand in a 500 degree oven? Big deal. It's hot. Don't do that. Don't even try to do that. Don't ever put your hands in 500 degree water. You'll burn the shit out of yourself. And it's because water transfers heat and holds heat way better. So it's a very powerful tool yeah. and you can control the percentage of humidity that you want in that oven. So what percentage, I'm just curious, it's not that it really matters in the business sense, but I'm just curious what percentage are you guys at? I would have to ask my chef Tanner. Um, but we, uh, we do use the humidity. So we're cooking it. So instead of like, like you said, a, a 500 degree oven or a 500 degree grill, you're cooking from the outside in, right? Yeah. So we cook, the burger is already cooked and we call it like coast to coast mid rare or, or medium where when you bite into a burger, traditionally, it's well done on the outsides and it's well done on the top and the bottom and you have a little bit of your desired temperature, right? So this, we sear both sides of it to get that good sear and get that Maillard effect, but your entire burger is the temperature that you wanted because it's fully cooked. So it's, it retains uh, more of its moisture, um, so you don't lose all of that fat and, and flavor from the burger. Um, and it's, it's literally, it's like a better way of cooking a burger while also being more efficient and, and, you know, practical, you know, in the new, um, so, do you, are you, okay. you're taking the raw meat, you're putting it on the grill, you're searing it, and then you're putting it in the CVAP or you're, no. you're warming all the meat up to 110 degrees, uh, and so, then you take it so and you just bring before, it to the next 30 degrees. Exactly. So we'll take, you know, sheet pan of uh, a full sheet pan, put 25 burgers on it, throw it into our oven at four o'clock, you know, or, you know, we're open at four now, but um, three o'clock. We set it, we have our, our, our browning, we have, um, you know, we can change all these variables and we can put in a whole pot roast or a whole roast of any sort and cook it overnight in there and it comes out perfect and it holds at a certain temperature. That's cool. So it's basically yeah. like air, air sous vide. Um, which is pretty cool. But so that, that coupled with the KDS screen, it, it made a, a world of difference That's for us. So you were doing 12 to 14 minutes per burger before. What does it take you now once the order, the ticket comes in, it goes on the KDS, from the time it, it, from the time it goes on the KDS, the time it's going out the pass, what, what, what are we looking at for time? We can do it in seven minutes. So almost in uh, half. That's great. Yeah. And, awesome. and we found it, it's pretty funny. Um, you know, you look at the data of it. So now we have, we can measure the time of when that ticket comes in on the screen to when we sell it. Cause you still have to double tap the screen to sell it to the expo printer that prints it out. And then it's still a traditional like kitchen shit that will then run food to a table. We got, we got too fast. So our check average started going down because people weren't sitting at their tables long enough to get an extra beer. Oh. So like our, our perfect check is two beers, an appetizer and two sandwiches for a party of two, you know, two beers each. So four beers total an order of wings or frickles and two sandwiches. And generally that will get somebody up around like a 25, $24 check average per person. So party of two, 50 bucks. We were finding that our ticket times, our turn times at the tables were 47 minutes when they should be like 55 but they weren't getting that extra beer. We would look at our data um, on our POS system. It's like, oh, they're only, you know, our beer, our draft beer numbers 
are down, but are, you know, we're, we're serving more people, but our numbers are down on beverages, yeah. but our ticket times for tables are down. So we're like, so we basically just, unfortunately there wasn't like a great system to tell us this. I know there's stuff out there, but it's far too expensive for us. <laughs> yeah. um, so we just, you know, just old school, just Excel spreadsheet and just looked at it and we're like, Oh my gosh. So we changed our prep times to, you know, we adjusted to it. So now we're back up to like 52 minutes, but we know that we can sell a burger in seven minutes if we need to. Uh, we hold back a little bit, but then when the rush starts coming in, it all has this way of working out to where you still get a burger in about, uh, about 15 minutes from when you put it in to when you get it. But what we're allowed to do because of that is the kitchen doesn't get overwhelmed with orders. So we know that we can buy time. So that first ticket that comes in, we're selling and we're not dragging those final tickets that all come in during the rush. What I love about what's happening right now is it's in my head, the compound effect, the compound effect. You could have been totally satisfied. Like, Hey, we're the best burger in the country. And you know, it takes us 12 minutes, but you know, whatever. But you know, if we were able to, increase the rate at which we can cook burger, burgers without sacrificing the quality and you found a way to do that and you you tap into that frontal lobe and get creative and just try to find solutions to be better these things compound you were crushing it in 2015 and now you're you're up 40 percent uh just by looking at things from different perspectives and getting creative and i just love that mentality of constant improvement constant constantly tweaking, constantly comparing yourself today to the person you were yesterday, but you need numbers, you need data to be able to do this. And I love that you go after it, even when it's not easy to find, like you created a spreadsheet and you just track this information because you, if you don't track it, if you can't, if you don't measure it, you can't do it. You don't know what the result of your efforts are. And it's so important right. to pay attention to these things. Um, it's incredible. Yeah, stuff. So right. go ahead. Do you want to add on to that? No, I mean, there's, there's all the data out there in the world, but if you don't use it to your, to either justify or a decision or to you know validate a gut feeling then then you know what's the point so yeah. it's um it, it's it's really important to us and that actually all of that work that we did a year ago perfecting this set us up so well for when everything hit the fan uh you know in march yeah um we're back and you just started alluding to the fact that all these efforts you made back in whatever it was 2016 2017 are really helping support you to even to this day especially with what's happening over the past two and a half months but before we get into that uh i really want to to you know break open that mind of yours and learn a little bit more about your approach for marketing because um i think that's one thing that you guys do really really well um so what like what is your technique when it comes to just let's just focus on email marketing I know so you had this pop up on your website. Uh, it's one thing I, I love that's not intrusive. It's just this little side pop up. Um, like, how are you collecting these emails? Like, what, what are the practices you're using? So we do it a couple different ways now. Um, obviously, the the sign up on our website is um, there's value to that. We obviously we get, I would say we get maybe ten a day. Um, how big is, is your email list? Not to um, right now be intrusive. It's about it's almost four thousand right now. Awesome. Um, which before, so it's interesting, right? So we had, um, we had pretty, you know, linear growth, right? Um, for our email list. And we weren't really using it when, when things were normal, we would use it every six weeks. That was our, our time frame because we would want to develop enough content to where it's worth somebody opening up. Everybody gets an email every week from all these other restaurants where it's just, it's the margarita special or it's, you know, some coupon or whatever it is, and you lose interest in it. We wanted to, our approach was, still is, if you open up that email from me, like there's going to be something of value for you. You know, it's not a wasted, I still get them. I'm signed up for a million emails um, because I like to see what other people are doing. And I find myself doing the same thing. I don't even open up emails from certain people, uh, from certain restaurants, because I know what their, what their approach is, you know, what they're trying to do. Um, So for us, the, the biggest thing for me from a marketing perspective has always been uh, being transparent and, and honest and being real. And, you know, we, we our, vo- our marketing voice is mine. Um, it's just kind of the way that I would approach marketing to myself. Um, and also like the people, you know, I'm 32 now. Um, 
and that's evolved a little bit, you know, over the past uh, seven years, it was our marketing and our branding was a little bit more rough around the edges um, from like a design menu standpoint, where it was a little bit more, I mean, our burgers are still very gluttonous, but um, over time we've refined our approach. Uh, we've refined the techniques that we use to apply to making burgers or sandwiches or cocktails or whatever it may be. It's just a little bit more cleaned up. And I think that that's evolved as I've evolved, you know, I'm older now. So, um, but our, our core demographic has grown with us. We're still getting people coming in for the first time that are my age when I opened, you know, mm-hmm. at 27 or at 25. Um, so it's, it applies to every demo, I think. Um, but the honesty and, you know, speaking to the quality and keeping it like having a dialogue, you know, of not trying to be stuffy with, you know, very um, predictable, like posts of like your weekly special that you get 5% off or coupons. Like we don't do any discounting. We don't do any, anything like that. It's just, Hey, here's our burger for the week. You know, we put a lot of thought into it. Our culinary team, you know, made this or whatever, and then um, blast it out there. And so our approach now, we now we send out an email every week um, because we have every time that we get an online order, we now get an email address. So, which is awesome. And so we've had exponential growth of our email list over the past eight weeks. Um, Wait, repeat that one thing over the past eight weeks that you started doing differently to give you exponential growth. Oh, um, online ordering for our takeout business in Warren. Everybody that orders through Toast has to provide their email address. So we have leveraged that data that we're getting. So in Toast, we we can see their orders, you know, how frequently they order, all those sorts of things. And now we just have their email that we can now use to directly market to people that ate with us in the past week. Um, yeah. Those people tend to be more engaged than people that haven't eaten with us in the past eight weeks. And we can, on toast, we can see, um, you can't drill down uh, super specific on, you know, the frequency of a diner, but you can get within the last uh, two months or last six weeks. Or um, So we know that now that we're into this thing for nine weeks, 10 weeks almost, we can look at some of that data and be like, okay, this many people have eaten with us, um, gotten takeout this email that we're sending out is more applicable to those people than it was. So when you're we using segmentation. You're, you're using segmentation. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What is segmentation and, for the listeners out there? Um, so we can dial in to our, our audience on, on email of either it's a, it's all our general mailbox or our general email list or people that have eaten with us during a certain frequency of, or certain uh, parameters of time. So whether it's two weeks or six weeks, you can even do it, you know, we can see how engaged people are. We use MailChimp. Um, oh, that was my next question. Thank you. For, for, yeah. Yeah. So you, they have ratings, right? So you can see, you know, people that don't, people that have like very low open rates. I'm just clearing the deck. Like I don't, you know, I'm either a burden to them or they just don't use that email anymore. Um, partly to save money because the MailChimp charges you based on how many subscribers you have. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, we want that, we want these emails going to people that we think are going to engage with us, yeah. whether it's through online ordering or um, basically that's the only, that's the name of the game right now. Right. So at the, at the very beginning of all of our emails, it says order burgers and beers and you can click on it. It goes right to it. Yeah. Um, our frequency, our, our amount of clicks since this has all started has gone up exponentially as well because people, that's how everybody's ordering now. You know, we still have Natural. about 10% of, yeah, about 10% of our people that order from us do still do phone, um, which we're still taking, you know, it's still uh, in order. Um, it's a little bit more cumbersome just because of the process. People have to call in, we get their phone number. We also yeah. do paying payment over the phone right now. Yeah. So, so, too. so one thing that's really powerful with email segmentation is, if you, you can look at even to like what your, your guests are ordering. So you can custom tailor offers to people that come in that always get this one burger, you know, like, you know, who gets this one burger every time they come in. So you can, and you can make a list of a hundred people that get this one burger every time they come in. And then you can send a specific email to that segment of people that get this one specific burger and say, if you come in or like, you know, we're running this special deal on X burger, 
and that now everybody that like, that's my favorite burger. Oh, like how do they like? And they're gonna come in, and you can you can just make it customizable, and that that's so powerful. Yeah. Um, and that's that, that data that you can get from your POS system. Um, the other thing that's really really powerful here too, and there's this, all this like this this noise out there about oh third party like delivery and like we don't own those customers and like how we're gonna be able to market back to these people. That's one beautiful thing when if you are using Toast for delivery, like you're getting the email from this person. So you instantly now can establish a digital virtual relationship with this person. You have their email. It's the most intimate thing online. I mean, is there, there's nothing like face-to-face -face marketing for wall marketing, but if you have this person's email, now you can create habits in that person to use your links, to use your website to order. Um, and you, you have to get that email. It's so powerful and it, it's automated mm -hmm. with Toast. And um, I keep on, we love toast over here at Restaurant Unstoppable. By far, the, the most recommended POS on the show. D did we plan this conversation before? Just, just I don't want people to think that no. this is like a giant <laughs> toast pitch. So no, toast is no. one of our current yeah toast is one of our current sponsors. Uh, if you use our links, head over to toasttab.com/unstoppable, and uh, if you use that link, toast will pay us two thousand five hundred dollars, and they're gonna throw one thousand dollars worth of incentives. But here's the thing: we're gonna split our profit with you guys and send you a check for a thousand dollars because you need it more than we do right now. And honestly, why not create win-win situations? Um, help. Use our links. We'll send you a check for a thousand dollars. You get a bunch of incentives. It's great. I should shut up now. It's starting a little too pitchy, but, uh, anyway, I just had to throw that out there cause it's so powerful. Um, anything else between this point in your career or this point over the past five years since we last talked, um, that had an impact on getting that bottom line up 40%. I think just more focus on, you know, understanding who we were, you know, at, you know, even when you open up, even after two years, you still don't really know. I don't think that you really know who you are as a restaurant. Um, and I think, you know, that's even more true now. I feel like now we finally have figured it out a little bit, but I know that if you and I talk again in hopefully it's more, it's less than another five years from now, but um, I'll say that what I know now about our company was like still in its infancy. So I think that not necessarily taking like what we've already done as, um, as good enough. You know, I think just like we talked about the CVAPs and the KDS and, you know, we're always changing. Um, we're always trying to get better. You know, we're always looking at things. Um, not that we think that we're not doing a good job at the certain things that we're doing, but I know there's always a better way to do it. There's, if you're not looking at things, whether it's a restaurant or whether it's, uh, a podcast or whether it's, you know, a car dealership. Um, if you're not doing those things, like people are just going to blow by you. You know, we always, I always have this feeling people kind of, uh, you know, catching up to us, you know, it's kind of like a fear, you know, it's kind of like a game, right? So we're always trying to stay ahead of um, not just trends, but being, you know, good, uh, you know, being a good restaurant, being a good place to work, being a, a great place to eat. Um, you know, and people still holding us to, you know, the standard that we set ourselves that we still don't think that we've achieved, but just like, you know, we continue to get after it every day and I don't really know any other way, you know, it's, it's fun, you know, to sit, to sit on your thumbs and, you know, let things go by and, and hope and wish that things will, will get better, um, are great, but like, you gotta, you gotta get in and get after the work because that's the only thing that's going to. Have you, for you. Have, you, have you screwed anything up, Sam, over the past five years? You told us about all the great things you've, you've been doing about, has, has there been any decision you made that you really just like smacked yourself in the forehead and said, Jesus, why did I do that? Um, yeah. So we opened <laughs> up, we opened up another restaurant in, um, in uh, the town over from where we uh, had Chomp or have Chomp. And um, at the time, it was 2016, um, we want, I wanted to do a different concept. I had kind of not not gotten bored with burgers, but I was just like, you know, I, I felt like I needed to to do something else, right? And um, it's a great restaurant. It's still open. Um, but I sold it a few years ago um, to the chef. And it was a good exercise for me for a lot of reasons. Um, it, showed, it, it helped me realize what my true passions are in this industry. Um, it helped me realize how much of a good thing this restaurant is. Um, and it helped me sort of refine my, my vision on like where I want to go. Um, 
in my career. You know, I what think if, that there's all these, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, what, what are your true passions? But if you want to finish your train of thought before you answer that, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I will answer that. Um, I forgot the question now. <laughs> so um, no, I was trying to think of all the things that, you know, there, there's all these distractions out there. You know, there's all these opportunities. There's all these um, other things that I wanted. I mean, even now, I mean, it's like, oh yeah, there's, a, there's literally a building across the street from where I am right now that I know is available. And it's like, all right, well, what can we put in there? It's like, no, like focus on what your, you know, your mission is. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our mission is to grow this restaurant, you know, chomp to, you know, as many, we don't have a, a finite number of, of units that we want to open or um, uh, locations that we desperately, you know, we don't need to have one in Boston. We don't need to have one in New York City. We don't need to have one in wherever to be successful, but it's, we want it to happen a little bit more organically. But we know that, or I know that this is the path that I find the most satisfaction in. Um, I love beer. Uh, I love the culture of beer. I love the nuance. I love everything about it. Um, I also love burgers and sandwiches. Like those are my, those are my comfort foods. You know, if there's, uh, you know, for, you know, if, if I can go home and cook any meal, it's probably going to be a sandwich, even though I'm surrounded by them every day. Yeah. Um, I still love them because there's so much that you can do with it. So it took me, you know, and so the other restaurant was, um, is a new American restaurant, great cocktail program, you know, just like chomp. It was from scratch. It was, it was all the things that, I think make a great restaurant a great restaurant. It still is. Um, but it took away from my focus of, you know, thinking of two different restaurants at the same time, two different concepts is very challenging. Um, when you don't have a huge headquarters of an HR team and a marketing team and a, you know, uh, you know, operational team, um, it's hard to wear all these hats for one restaurant with one concept. Never mind be thinking of two different Basically, I like it. It's like thinking of two different parts of my brain 100% of the time where one food idea might be applicable to one restaurant and it might not be applicable to the other. Um, and it just became, it started draining me, you know, and it started just uh, making me lose focus on what I got into the whole business for. It was to, was to you know, it was to grow. And I guess you could argue that opening a second restaurant is growth. Um, but just like, you know, I'm sitting in our second shop location right now that we're opening up in a couple of weeks and this one wasn't growth for the sake of growth. It was waiting, finding the right location, not taking on investors, not doing anything that you could force. You know, I think I could have forced myself into a lot of other situations over the past five years, but holding to my, and my wife, you know, checking me too. Um, you know, not making decisions that don't align with what we're trying to do. So we, we started doing a lot more catering this past year. It's been why it was wildly successful. You know, we did four weddings last year. We had Dude, who's three getting burgers weddings. for their wedding. Whoever those people are, I want, I want to be their friends because that's my kind you, of we, we threw, we threw <laughs> a pretty epic wedding. And it's funny, the juxtaposition between uh, some very fancy venues in Rhode Island and a burger poutine mac and cheese bar, you know, but that's, that's what people want, you know, mm -hmm. and we, we were able to grow that. We started growing that business really, really well internally. Um, but it's still, it's, it, it checked off the boxes for me because it wasn't outside of our core business strategy. Yeah. Wait, wait, so was this another by another byproduct of using these CBAPs being able to bring however many burgers you can fit into a CBAP CBAP? Um, that and then finish that, them on site or um a little bit um so we so our big thing for catering is it's all live cooking you know on site so we don't actually use those CVAPs for catering um we can use them and there's definitely restaurants or catering companies that do use them that's a huge you know alto shams and and cambros and you know anything that you can use to hot hold food is is a huge bonus for caterers um but we part of our our marketing strategy for our catering is that, you know, we might do the traditional like meat and steak or meat and fish and chicken, but we're doing, you know, whole fish grilled over, you know, charcoal and we're doing brisket and we're doing, 
spatchcock chickens that have been brining for 24 hours and we're also doing like it's like real food you know it's not food that's been sitting in a in a hot holder since three o'clock when you're not eating dinner till 7 30 it's like no there's a grill behind where you're getting your food right now and you're seeing the chef cook it and there's a lot more um know, it's just kind of sexier too to, to like smell yeah. real food cooking at a wedding versus a stuffy little plate with a filet that's this big yeah. and um so you know it was a market that we were that we were going after um pretty aggressively so that was you know that was a different business but it was still within our 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 main focus of of growing the chomp brand so um, when you say you're up 40 percent gross is that including the revenue from catering or is that a separate no. okay awesome. that, yeah that's separate yeah so we you know having a bigger having a beer garden and just you know, those peaks and valleys, um, you know, the, the peaks aren't as, as high as they used to be, but the valleys also aren't as low. So we are now more, we still have ups and downs like every other restaurant does, but we're stronger across the board. You know, we were, um, still are, um, six days a week as opposed to having like, you know, most restaurants, they need to have a great weekend to, you know, to be okay. Um, you know, we were doing well on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, and then weekends were also good. So we're just putting ourselves in a really good spot to be as, as efficient as we could, to be as, as profitable as we could, um, so that we could continue to grow. I love it. So anything else that you want to talk about over the past five years, before we start getting into your response to COVID, we got 20 minutes to talk about COVID. We got, we got to still wrap up with the speed round. Yeah. Um, I think the focus is the biggest thing. I mean, I think, you know, the distractions of new shiny objects um, or, or new space or new concepts um, and keeping those at bay and focusing on the task at hand, focusing on the good thing that we do have and, and growing that. And I think yeah. focusing on growing, growing a better team, growing a more cohesive team, you know, complementing each yeah. other. It's like, you know, I, I played college baseball uh, and worked in baseball for a while and you know the team aspect of it we apply every day but then looking at the people that work for us you know as a team it's like okay we have some strong people here you know we need, need to bring these people up a little bit it's like building a lineup in baseball or you know uh you know anything else any, any other sport it, it translates to but trying to find people that are complementary to each other and bringing somebody that has a different uh maybe a different view on on food you know how does that you know spark a light for other people in the restaurant, you know, has a spark light for me having somebody that came from, you know, our chef in Providence who's opening, her name is Nikki. She was in fine dining. Like, all right, totally different outlook on food um, because she's been doing it successfully for a long time. How is she going to let you, or how is she going to help you compound even better because of that experience of fine dining? Like what perspective is she going to have that you guys miss? You know, it's so, it can be so powerful. Yeah. So it's, you know, like anybody else, you kind of, you, if you're doing something for a long enough time, you kind of get into a little, not a rut, but like a groove of like, okay, this works. Let's put, you know, three different cheeses on it. Let's make this aioli. And let's, you know, we have a formula that we, that we use more or less to make a special or to make yeah. a menu item. Um, she was just, she, and she still does, um, you know, she brings in new flavor ideas, you know, new ways of cooking something, new ways of preparing, uh, an aioli or cooking a piece of pork differently or just developing different flavor profiles, you know, building those flavors up from a, a fine dining standpoint, then, um, you know, what we were doing before was working very well, it still is, but just having a new outlook on our concepts and somebody that we brought in that is incredibly talented and whose value or whose opinion we value so much. It's like, all right, maybe, you know, we're never doing it a hundred percent the best way. Like let's figure out, you know, maybe we do, the burger this way now, or you yeah. know, she said, even, even just our line, you know, the way that we had our cooking line set up. Like, okay, hey, why, why don't we put, you know, just a new set of eyes. Okay. Like, hey, well, why don't we put these squeeze, squares, uh, squeeze, bleh, squirt bottles in the middle instead of on the left? It's like, 
well, yeah, I guess that makes 100% of, you There's know. There's a million different things if you keep your mind open and you're willing to constantly improve that you can do and all these things compound. And before you know it, yeah. you're up 40% and your ticket times are cut in half. And like that's what happens yeah. when you're constantly improving. Uh, I love it. And the other thing I just need to lean into, I need to put emphasis on that came up in that last tear you went on is this idea that you don't grow by looking outwards and going, where can we move? Like what, what location can we open? You grow by looking inwards and saying, what do we got? And who do we got? And how can we make them better? And how can we make yeah. them so good that they've outgrown the position they're in and that we need to put them in another store in order for them to even reasonably stay with us because they're better than what they're doing now. You know what I'm saying? Like that's where growth right. comes from. Putting the, the, the energy into your people, into your team and compounding and doing one thing really well right here, you know? And then you take that thing that's really well, you have these people and then that's, that's the way we want to grow. That's where growth comes from. Inside out, not outside in. I love it. Um, so, Let's talk about COVID real quick. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about how you reacted uh, because we should have reacted by now, right? Uh, but, but how did you react? What things did you do to stay relevant when the government made, made us shut down? Mm -hmm. So in, in Rhode Island where we are, um, that was instituted on March 20, or I think March 17th is when the order came down, um, right before St. Patrick's Day because they wanted to avoid, you know, any gatherings for them. Especially um, up in the Northeast. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Boston, Boston didn't do that and it got a little hairy. Um, so, you know, it, we were already set up, like I said, all the, you know, we already had online ordering, we already had cut our ticket times down, we had done all these things, not certainly not preparing for something like this, but it was just, okay, this is like the way that we're trying to get this business going. Um, so it worked for us. Um, if we hadn't done those things, we had an incredible demand for our burgers the first couple of weeks that we were doing so we we used to be our the location where i am in warren used to be a car hop used to be an aw root beer stand so from a marketing perspective as soon as this all came down it's like all right no more dining rooms takeout only i was like all right i'm definitely doing i'm bringing back the nostalgia of the car hop mm. so it's, it's called the chomp car hop um you order online uh you stay in your car so it's super safe the spots are now numbered in our parking lot so you pull into a spot you text us we have a text to landline app that we use. And uh, you say, hey, last name is Glenn. In spot three, we bring your food out, put it in your trunk, and uh, you drive off. Break this uh, down a little bit further. What technology are yeah. you using um, so, to, to, to communicate? Um, you mentioned Toast. I'm assuming you're using Toast to place the order. Are you using a landing page? What are you telling your people? Like, break that down, the process. Yeah. Thing more. So um, Instagram, you know, now that they have that sticker for online ordering, that's huge. Um, we were doing, you know, we have 12,000 followers. So we have that swipe up feature, which you, you get at like 10,000, I think. Um, so that helped drive traffic. And we were just, the first couple of weeks, we were just hammering people. It's like order online, order online, order online. Um, the first two weeks, we didn't have a text to landline set up. So our phone lines would get, we had one phone line because I don't know, that's just what you do, right? Um, people couldn't get through. So we'd have, we had a, at one point we had a line of cars. I know that, you know, if it was just basically you go outside and you just put your head down because you don't want people looking at you. That's how many people were waiting for our food because they couldn't get their line. They couldn't get into the restaurant to call us to say, Hey, I'm at spot three or four. So it was a mess. So I was up all night that night trying to figure out like, how does this work? I was like, what if they just text us? Cause then we could respond to multiple text messages in a fraction of a second. We set up a template. We use a company called Easy Texting, um, which is for 30 bucks a month. It's, it's definitely worth it. It's worth, it's worth a dollar a day, 100%. Mm -hmm. And then um, from a marketing perspective, now we have close to 3,000 phone numbers that we can use for texting. We haven't deployed that yet, but it's, it's in the works um, just to get more eyes on specials and, and whatnot. Um, so the systems that we put in place were, were as good as we as good as we can get. And, and now over the past nine weeks, um, it's really become a lot more smooth. You know, more restaurants have opened up now back in, in Rhode Island. So there's more opportunity for people to eat at other places. But those first three weeks, I think we were one of only a few restaurants in our area that was open. And it was, the surges were like, they were intense. You know, yeah. Were you and, making uh, more before COVID came or? Like when you doing more covers? Yeah. Um, so we, we've been very, you know, I think we're lucky, but we also worked really hard to, 
to do what we're able to do right now. Yeah. But, um, you know, sales for us have been good. Um, they haven't, you know, we're still doing roughly what we were doing prior to COVID-19 than, um, than now. And it's sustained, you know, it's and are you been, talking about gross or are you talking about profit? Cause I, I would imagine with fewer people on staff, um, you're probably even more profitable, even though you're making yeah. less gross. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting, um, I think the, the whole, we don't want to like, it's, it's weird thinking about letting people go. and like, that's not a good thing. Yeah. But, um, well, you start to, you start to figure out, you know, the hand that you're dealt and you start to figure out ways that you can run your business, uh, efficiently with less people. You know, there are some concessions that we had to make. We cut our menu down significantly. Um, some of the core items that people really enjoyed, like our fried pickles are not on the menu because we don't have enough fryer space. Um, so things like that, we had to make adjustments on, but the, the labor cost for us is significantly less. Um, we're only open for 12 hours a week right now. We used to be open for over 40. So, but we're still doing roughly the same amount of sales. So it's, it's something that we never thought that, you know, we would never six months ago be like, Hey, we're going to have this crazy idea and be open for only 12 hours and hope that we, you know, do the same amount of sales. Yeah. I, I think, think that part of go ahead. God, you, but I think part of that too is also, this is the only way that people can dine right now. Um, Rhode Island just opened up outdoor dining um, last week and when they start indoor dining at 50% capacity on June 1st. So, we will not be doing indoor dining. Um, our, our locations just don't, it just doesn't work. It doesn't feel like it's a good time for us to do that right now, especially since we still have business that's doing well in our parking lot. Um, so we don't want to disrupt that because I think that online ordering and takeouts is going to be around for a long time. So that's still, that's how we need to make our money right now. You know, yeah. there's not a, a lot of federal support for small businesses right now. So we got to make our money. Um, so we, you know, every restaurant's different, as you know, um, but we've been very, very fortunate. And, but it was a lot of hard work. Uh, our team, we had four people when we first started with this thing because we didn't know what to expect. It was my first day that we were doing it. It was just me and our chef for Warren, our chef of Providence. And then uh, we got crushed. Next day, brought in back our manager. Next day, brought in two more people. And now we have eight people that work there again. Um, it's not like it was, but it's, it's better than nothing. You know, they're staying busy. We're staying safe, but it's, it's certainly an adjustment, but it's made us look at the whole business model different. Yeah. I'm loving this man. Uh, great stuff. So what's your plan for the future? Like what key things, like what's house chop going to look different in the next six months to a year? Well, takeout's going to be a big portion of our revenue. Um, you know, I don't see an opportunity for us to really get dine in traffic like we used to have. It's a small, you know, in Warren, it's a small restaurant. Um, it's 1,200 square feet, 38 feet interior. It's another 30 feet outside. We will definitely re leverage that outdoor space as much as we can if they reduce the amount of space that we have to have between each table. Hope to get back to some sort of normal capacity so that we could have dine-in because there's demand for it um, in Rhode Island. But really just honing in our systems for takeout. You yeah. know, what are some of your plans for that real quick? Just sorry to interrupt. But what are some of your plans? Because you're always yeah. improving your cost. So I know you have some plans in the back of your head. Like, oh, we could do this better. We could probably do that better. If you're like, what are those things that you're playing with in the back of your mind? Um, we're, we're looking at different takeout boxes. We're looking at better different branding. Different takeout boxes? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so. Oh, like the, the quality, packaging. The quality of the bag, yeah. Or the quality of the, um, the box. So right now we use the clamshell. It's a you know biodegradable fiber material, and it's really good. It holds heat for a while. It's energy, you know it's um, eco friendly. It's a good size for us. What's the name but, of the company you're sourcing from? Um, we that one I think it's from Pack Tech. Okay. Uh, they're a pretty big you know a pretty big company. Um, but you know there's is there a better is there a more efficient way to pack our bags? Is there you know, basically now, you know, do we have the right bag to pack all of the stuff? Because what we're finding is a lot of people that order takeout, you know, although we do have the people that would just order one burger, most people it's ordering for an entire family because everybody's stuck at home and nobody wants to cook. So it's, it's four burgers, it's two orders of wings, and that doesn't fit in a bag that we have. So is there a better way to pack our wings? Is there a better way to pack our burgers? Um, we're working with our, um, a, a company on branding our bag so that, when you're holding that bag, it's chomp. You know, we're trying to 
you know, we're talking about doing it on our boxes. Do we put tape on it to seal it because people are more concerned about safety more than ever, right? So how do we continue to stay true to who we are, but at your house? kind of a weird thing to think of but. yeah and, and that's a really important thing like that's one thing we can all do better is take out and there's so many there's so much room for improvement and in our minds we just shove it in the bag and it goes out the door and that's that but we got to think about that end user experience well, what can we do to make that end user experience as great as possible and as appealing as possible right yeah yeah how do you replicate the the experience that you have in a restaurant normally you know how do you convey that to a car at the park or mm. you know a picnic and there's only so much you can do with the takeout box um, aesthetically, you know, but there's, there's tons of things that you can do to, you know, so we don't put any of the sauces on our fried chicken sandwiches anymore. Um, we put them on the side so that you can put on as much as you want. One, because the, the sauce is spicy, um, but two, because it travels better when there's not a bunch of sauce sitting on a piece of fried chicken. It stays crispy yeah. longer and it stays, it's just more white. It's, it's more similar to how you would experience it if you were eating it at a table in a restaurant. Um, you know, all those things, you know, can we get the system down better for the car hop? You know, how do we, in Providence, we don't have a parking lot. We're in a city on a street. So the car hop service isn't applicable to us. So how do we create a system that is efficient and safe on a city street? You know, how do you keep people lined up in a way that is not going to freak everybody out? Yeah. So it's, it's a lot, but it's, you know, there's options out there. It's just figuring out the best one that works for you. So what do you think the, the, the future as far as like the industry looks like? Do you think, you know what, one thing I've been trying to communicate to my listeners is to not be so reactive. We're reactive by nature. We are, I mean, we are very reactive. We've, we've only had this frontal lobe for so long. We still have a lot of the qualities of our, you know, our, our, our ancestors, our monkeys, you know, we, we just yeah. react to what's happening, what's happening, what's happening. One thing I want to communicate is now's the time we can all agree to not react and be proactive and say, how do we want to come back? What things like you, one thing that you said the last time when we had you on the show is to challenge the status quo. There has never been a better time to challenge the status quo. Now's the time for us to go, why are we going to come back the way things were? You know, like now right. we, we're, we're still together. How can we come back better? What changes does our industry need and how can we be intentional and proactive about that? Not reactive, but proactive. So when I say this, mm -hmm. what goes through your mind? Oh gosh, there's a lot. Um, you know, I think that, you know, one thing that a lot of restaurants are finding, like you just mentioned is, is profitability is better. Um, you know, having smaller menus, you know, not having to have a huge menu with a huge staff and a huge restaurant, you know, people in this industry, they work their tails off to make five cents on the dollar, seven cents on the dollar. What's wrong with making more money? You know, what's wrong with being a, a more intelligent business operator? So you can provide a more livable wage, that so you can provide better living, you know, better benefits. You know, if a restaurant can make more money and be more uh, profitable, which I think a lot of times gets a negative connotation um, because it implies that we're hoarding all of this money. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity within the industry to, to flourish. I think that the way of, of everything needs, it is going to change, um, you know, with, just the way that people approach opening up a restaurant, you know, where the, the takeout is now um, a big portion of our business. So you can get into a smaller space. You, you don't need a, a huge dining room with 15 servers um, to make, to make money. You know, you mm -hmm. can have a, a thousand square foot spot in a great location with a little kitchen and operate and, and do yeah. okay. And I, I think that there's a lot, I hope that on the other side of this, you know, I know there's a lot of, of talk about how the industry does get better and i think you know there needs to be nobody has a plan right now of how you know it, it is going to get better but there's a little i think there's a little glimmer of hope that the way that people look at their business model is going to allow for them to be a little bit more nimble with changing their businesses and yeah. not feeling like they are at the mercy of all of their guests yeah you know it's like oh i need to keep this on the menu because three people come in a week and order it like that's gone. You know, we have yeah. people that order that call in because they don't look at our menu online and they order something that hasn't been on the menu for 10 weeks. It's like, well, we don't have that. And I'm sorry. And they're like, okay, well, I'll get this then. Yeah. That proved to us like, okay, you know, we can, Frickles were our number one appetizer. 
We sold a ton of them. They were a pain in the butt to make, but they're they're fantastic. Did you get like best pickle fried on. pickle in like in the country at one point, or was it just Rhode Island? Not in the country, in the state. I in think the it state. was the. I think the. Um, yeah, it was. I think one of one restaurants entered that that competition, but um, <laughs> but I'll take it. It's it's nice to hang on the wall. Yeah. Um, but I think if people, you know, limitations for a lot of people, I think were things that restaurant owners didn't want to be a reason why they, you wouldn't dine with us. Um, and like you said, being reactive, you know, last week is, is a, this is an example. Um, outdoor dining started last week and most people were very gung ho. They were renting tents. They were getting tables. They were taking over spaces and parking lots. They were doing all these things. It's like, guys, is anybody even going to come? Do we yeah. know that, you know, and we did polling on Instagram, just very, you know, basic Instagram story, yes or no, uh, likely or unlikely. Um, and we found that 76% of people still weren't comfortable going out to eat. So we're like, okay, we had a sample, it was a thousand person sample size. So it's pretty good data. And we're like, all right, well, we don't need to be the first ones to do this. So let's see what happens this week. So last week we opened up on Wednesday. We got like right out, right when we got into the restaurant the phone was ringing off the hook and we're like are you open for outdoor dining are you open for outdoor dining like no we're kind of gonna wait and see how things go we don't have any systems set up yet um intentionally because we wanted to see how everybody else is going yeah back. yeah and so that day i left i took wednesday night off i talked to my team the next day I said hey how many more phone calls did you guys get that night and they're like we got like five more and i was like Ugh. all right you know just kind of keep it up in my in my mind next day thursday same thing, you know, more calls, more frequency, um, more people asking for it. And we we're like, you know what? Maybe there's something here. Cause I would drive home and I'd drive by all the restaurants in town and some people did it and it was packed, not packed in the sense that you would traditionally see restaurants packed before this, but like it was busy. People wanted to get out. People needed some sense of normalcy. So on Friday, we we're like, you know what? We already have set up. We're just going to pull a few tables so that we stay socially, socially distanced and see if it works. And we we booked up reservations very quickly. Were you um, doing reservations before? No. Yeah. So you brought so, in reservations, which I think is smart because you don't have limited space. You know, you don't you don't want people to show up and have to leave. You know. Yeah. And in Rhode Island, it's reservation is mandatory. Uh, you have to make a reservation in the state to to dine. Um, well, you don't want a bunch of people standing great. outside either. You know, you want to yeah. It makes yeah. Sense. Yeah. You want to limit the uh, any sort of congregating. So yeah. so we, so we did it. We sent out an email. We were super transparent in our safety measures. We were super transparent in understanding that um, when you walk in, when you walk out, you need to wear a mask and you do all these things. And I think that resonated with people because they're like, and then we got a ton of messages on Instagram. It's like, hey, I don't feel comfortable going out to eat, but I would go eat at Chomp because I trust you guys. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen what you've done with Carhop. I've seen what you've done um, with the, the precautions that you're taking because you're showing we're showing our guests that like, Hey, yeah, we're taking this seriously. You know, we're, we're trying to operate a business and, and we, cause we need to, but we're going to try and do it in a creative way that keeps you safe, but still allows you to eat and, and, you know, have a beer and enjoy yourself. A guy last night sent us a message. He was like, I just need to go sit somewhere that's not my living room and have a beer and a burger. Can I make a reservation? Like, Absolutely can. Yeah. So we're, retur we're returning a little bit of that to, um, which is nice. It's encouraging to see people on, in a restaurant again. After not seeing them for nine weeks, our dining rooms become a, a warehouse, um, much like so everybody else's. But we gotta leave room for this the speed round. Uh, I'm loving the okay. conversation, Sam. But before we go into that speed round, try to answer this quickly. One, the, the, our our mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. And you've already said that you've evolved over the past five years. So how have you transformed, real quick, over the past five years since the last time we talked to you? Um, I think I've become a, a better leader. Um, by I read a lot more now um, I also I think I I used to be young and you know when you're young you're young and you don't you don't know what you don't know right? you're 25 years um, old when you open your first restaurant. yeah yeah I didn't know anything yeah. um, surrounding myself with people that know a lot more than me you know just being in the industry longer now um, really having a great group of, of close people that I can talk to about whatever comes up um, listening to our staff, you know, giving them more ownership in, in what we're doing. Um, I get more satisfaction out of that now than ever. 
yes. you know, coaching somebody along and having them do a job that I used to do and seeing them be gratified by the trust that I put in them. Uh, you know, it means everything to me now. Yeah. You know, I, good. That's I was going to say, no, I love this uh, idea also of bringing people together uh, and, and, and collaborating with other restaurateurs and sharing knowledge. And I think mean, that's one thing we're trying to do here at Restaurant Unstoppable is say, hey, like no more holding secrets close to your chest. As a matter of fact, the more generous you are with that knowledge, the more successful you're going to be because you're going to attract on people, you know, and, it, and you can collaborate and you can find out where you're, if you're open and honest about where you're not strong, then, but you're also open and honest about where you are strong, then you can find, you can, you can, you can we're, we're meant to work in groups. We're meant to come together. We're meant to support. We're tribal animals, you know, like it's part of us, you know, and, and I just love this, that, that whole mentality for Sherry. All right, we're back. And the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Um, lack of complacency. What is your biggest weakness? Lack of complacency. <laughs> what is one thing you feel, uh, one question you ask or thing you do during the interview process when you're, when you're growing your team, how are you feeling out that prospective employee? Uh, the question that I always ask is, you know, what sort of hobbies do they have outside of uh, work. I mean, if they love to bartend, like what else do you do? If you like to go fishing or if you like to play pickup basketball, um, I look for things that, that take dedication outside of work. If you have that fuse that you, or if you have that switch that you can turn on to be a really good, you know, uh, like downhill mountain biker, or, uh, you love long, long distance running. Like you have that gear that you can shift into that, like there's passion. There. You just want to see that they can get excited. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Uh, what is your biggest challenge today? Uh, opening a restaurant in two weeks. Yeah. Um, typically, I follow <laughs> this question with how are you dealing with that? But that's too loaded. So I'll give you yeah, a that's not like uh, that's <laughs> share <laughs> Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. This is a core value, a way to be, a way to act. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, not knowing where people that are coming from are going to um, – are eating with us. So whether, you know, it's somebody, you know, it's like genuine hospitality is, you know, just making, you know, like it's a Danny Meyer, right? Making somebody feel better the way they left them when they came in. Um, you know, we, we work on that every single day. We try to be as hospitable as we can. It's more challenging now because you, you can't interact with people, but we're still yeah. finding ways to do it. Yeah. Uh, what is one book that's a must? Oh, I skipped one. What is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So this is something that's common within your four walls, but not common throughout the industry. Um, we have a flag or a banner in our kitchen that says every damn day on it. And uh, it's, a, it's another mantra. Um, but we, we really preach like you can't decide what days you want to show up. I mean, you can show up physically every day, right? But if you don't show up mentally every day, you know, it's kind of a wasted day. Um, um, you only get so many of them. Yeah, and that just makes me think of our, our boy, Mario Del Perro, uh, the importance of working in language into your culture. And like every culture across the world has a language, right? And your business has, has a language. And this is an example of that. Like every damn day is, is your language. Uh, what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant operator? Um, I mean, I love all of the Jocko books, Extreme Ownership. I give to every manager, um, as well as setting the table from Danny Meyer. Um, I'm always looking for new ones. I'm always looking for better ways to, to, to convey, you know, the leadership strategies that we try to, to embody. Um, yeah. so those are the top two right now. And both those books are on audio. If you head over to audibletrial.com slash unstoppable, uh, you get your first book on us and you're supporting the show that that's $15 into our checking account and it really helps right now. Sponsors are not spending money. Uh, <laughs> name one service you've hired or outsourced to. So this isn't um, a technology, by the way, this is like a person, like a, somebody who does something better than you. So you're going to them to help you out. Oh, um, I mean, our accountant, um, you know, we, so we use something called plate IQ, uh, to capture all of our, um, invoices. We scan them. They, they take the code, they basically digitize our invoice for us, and then it's imported into QuickBooks, but our accountant reconciles all of that. So I'm still very, very intimately involved with our food costs. Um, we can now 
Um, I don't have to do all of the journal entries. I don't have to do all of the time consuming data entry that, uh, that I used to do. I think it's important yeah. when you first start, but, uh, time is, time is a tool. We need to use yeah. it. So is your accountant taking on new clients or do you want to keep them? Uh, <laughs> probably. Yeah. They probably take on new clients right now. Give them a shout out. Uh, farmer and first CPAs in Warren, Rhode Island. All right. Uh, what is one technology you've adopted within the four walls of your industry that's had a huge influence on operations, communication, efficiency? You just mentioned Play IQ, but is there another one that has you excited? Um, you know, right now we're looking at a better CR or customer uh, relationship management platform, um, just with reservations, with all this data that we're getting from everything being online now. There's a ton of ways to utilize that that information. So we're looking for a way to kind of to bring it all together. We're looking at a few different, um, which one has you most, platforms. I don't want to, I don't want to show your hand. I, think, I don't want to, I know I'm currently negotiating with them. Yeah. To to this site. This will be live in two weeks. So make your decision quickly. Okay. Uh, I'm right now we're looking at talk. Um, okay. I really like the way that they pivoted their business super quick to adapt to everybody else's restaurant, um, doing online ordering and, and their, their customer relationship management platform that ties into toast. Um, seems really robust. We're, uh, we're still kind of kicking the tires on it, but um, right now it's a, a strong option for us. Beautiful. And this is the last question. It's a doozy. Get ready for it. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work and your restaurants would be lost with your departure with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you can leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? The top one. Jeez. Well, I think of the every damn day thing that comes to mind That's just one. because you got to show up. Um, I'm really proud of the team that we've built uh, in the, what they, you know, I have this idea in my head of, you know, how a restaurant is perceived and these people, they buy in, you know, they're drinking the Kool-Aid. So the team and the culture is very important. It's that two. Too. Um, in the product. You know, I, I want people to remember our, our food for, you know, the best burger that they can possibly get and, and feel like they got value for it, feel like they were taken care of and, um, and feel good about spending their money. I love it. This has been a great chat, Sam. It, it always is. Uh, thank you so back. Or thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, it was an honor to share what you've been up to over the past five years and how you're handling this. Uh, and we wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. Uh, I can't remember the last time. I know I connected with the person that you, you called out last time. Their name's escaped. I think, yeah, it was a, a, a friend of mine named Rick. Um, yes. Who Bales? owns a restaurant Bales? called, or, no, Rick uh, Allaire. Allaire, that's um, what it was. He, he owns a restaurant called Medicom Kitchen. Um, yes. He's doing some really cool stuff too. So um, I would definitely put uh, Jake Rojas on the spot. He owns a great restaurant. It's actually across the street from where we are right now in Providence called Tallulah's Taqueria. And um, he's an incredibly successful business owner and chef. And uh, I think that he'd be a great guest for you guys. He was a past guest, but you know, I'm doing this oh, whole thing where, no, it's fine. I'll go back to him because uh, one of the uh, lessons I've learned here at Restaurant Unstoppable, it's not necessarily about the size of your network, it's about the quality of your network. And he was a great guest. Yeah. So I'd love to get him back on the show. And uh, how can we connect with you if you have any questions about the technology or systems, or uh, maybe we want to come join your team. Maybe we're just impressed by the conversation and we want to join your team. What's the best way to connect? Yeah, you can go on our website. Um, for, for job opportunities. You can also email me directly. It's just sam at chompari.com. Um, if you have any questions about any of that stuff or social handles, you know, I think um, chompri.com or chompri.com is the website, but all of our Instagram handles and Facebook or in Twitter are all at chompri, like Rhode Island. Awesome. Great stuff, Sam. Thank you so much again. Uh, there is no questioning, my man. You are unstoppable. Thank you, Eric. This is fun. If you enjoyed this video, please help us out. You can do it by liking, sharing, subscribing, and hitting that bell icon. It really helps out. And don't forget, there's a complete archive of every episode with show notes at restaurantunstoppable.com.